أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I begin in the name of Allah the most gracious the dispenser of grace and I invoke his peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام I ask Allah to shower his blessings upon each and every one of you uh, first I wanted to uh, really uh, say Jazakallah khair to Sister Maryam for, mashallah, a very eloquent presentation. I wanted to acknowledge her um, really hard work uh, and also that of my sisters uh, over here for outnumbering the brothers. So I ask the brothers to give a round of applause to the sisters. And also, uh, if the sisters can give a round of applause because the brothers gave you a round of applause. <laughs> I am uh, uh, I'm supposed to be talking to you about uh, the issue of uh, manliness and how it's uh, defined in Islam. So inshallah I'll spend the next 25 to 30 minutes uh, basically trying to uh, deconstruct the ideas that have been uh, basically uh, fed into our minds about what it means to be a man. So. The majority of this lecture will be targeting the brothers, but also the sisters need to pay attention so that you are able to give them the benefit of the doubt when they act weird. <laughs> when they do uh, things just out of uh, culture and upbringing and, and how society uh, determines for them how they're supposed to think of themselves and women. Let me start, inshallah, by telling you a quick story. Uh, it was a very hot day uh, in Mecca, uh, around noon, the Prophet said, I left the masjid was walking on his way, uh, going uh, to his house, extremely hot, you know, 45 degrees Celsius, probably. And he saw that woman in the corner of the street, you know, kind of, you know, complaining a little bit. You know, she's speaking out loud, you know, where did all the good men go, kind of, kind of statement. Uh, where is chivalry? Uh, and the Prophet approached her, Sallallahu and he said, Ya khala, and see, he doesn't say woman or lady, why are you yelling? Ya Khala, uh, my aunt, uh, why are you upset? You know, is there anything I can help you with? And she said, I have all this luggage and I was waiting for someone to help me out. See, she's not asking. She's not requesting from anybody to help her out. But she's expecting a man with a chivalrous attitude to just approach her and say, Khala, let me pick up your stuff. So he said, don't worry about it. I'll pick it up for you. So he picks up the luggage. And they walk all the way from downtown Mecca to the outskirts that by the time they arrive at her house, it's Maghrib, right? So it took him about four or five hours of his day, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to just help one woman. So we take her uh, to her house and he drops off the luggage. And then she says, you know, my son, I, I want to thank you. You've done a great favor today. I don't know how to thank you. He says, don't worry about it. You know, just, just you know, uh, if you need anything else, let me know. He's about to leave and she said, okay, I have nothing to give you but an advice. He said, absolutely, give me an advice. He said, you know, my son, I'm an old woman, I have experience. I'm warning you, don't ever listen to this guy, his name is Muhammad, okay? <laughs> don't ever listen to him. He will either cast a spell on you with his magic, or he will use sugar-coated word that will just dazzle you. So the Prophet kind of smiled. And he said, well, that, that's an interesting advice. It's very, do you have any other advice for me? <laughs> And she said, no, just beware of this man, Muhammad Hill, he's crazy, right? He's, he's, a, he's a saucer. So the Prophet ﷺ said to her, you know, I, I'm really sorry to say this, I, I don't want to burst your bubble, but I'm Muhammad, okay? And we've spent half a day together, did you see any saucery coming out of me? Did I even talk to you about Islam? Did I make da'wah to you? Did, did I use any sugar-coated words? The woman was taken aback. She was consumed with guilt. And he was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I don't, I don't know what to say. You know, hey, don't worry about it. You are the, a victim of the misinformation in Mecca out there. I, don't worry about it. Don't even think about it at all. I'm just going to go now, okay? Next day, she comes to the Prophet ﷺ, and she says to him, Ya Muhammad, first of all, I wanted to apologize for what I said and did yesterday. And, and the chivalry and the manliness and the honor that you have demonstrated yesterday tells me one thing. 
that everything I've heard of you was a lie. And here I am, right here in your presence, accepting Islam, and I want you to be my prophet. It is an absolute honor, it's an absolute exhilaration to consider yourself among the followers of Muhammad That is the kind of man you want to be associated with. This is the kind of honor, manliness, and chivalry that he demonstrated right? And we think of manliness, we think of toughness with testosterone, right? But that is not how he understood it. Think of all the good qualities associated with uh, medieval knighthood, right? Chivalry, honor, courtesy, gallantry, bravery, helping people even if it comes at your disadvantage, taking care of, of women and helping them up and so on and so forth. That is precisely what Muhammad sallallahu did. The topic or the subject of today's lecture can be discussed in seminars. We can spend weeks talking about this, but I only have 20, 25 minutes. So, out of which we lost five minutes already. So I'm gonna give you snapshots of our improper and erroneous understanding of manliness and how Muslims and how the Prophet and his Sahaba demonstrated the opposite attitude. We associate manliness, as Sister Maryam eloquently told us, with the domination of women. We men give ourselves, especially in the Muslim community, we give ourselves the right to tell women how to behave, what they're supposed to do, the space in which they're supposed to operate. We confine them in dirty little places that are called the sister's area in the masjid. We deny them access to the masajid. You can clap, it's not haram, by the way. We deny them access to, to the masajid, to the decision-making process. We settle with the sister's committee which is euphemism for go home, we don't want to see you, right? Uh, very few massage, and I've been to many states and I've served in many communities, very few massage uh, have women on their boards, Alhamdulillah Salam does, we have three sisters on our board that are elected by the community, but this is how it is. And it, it, it even becomes so disturbing when you see that in student organizations, at MSAs, right? They deny sisters access, as she eloquently mentioned, earlier, right, under totally false pretenses, by the way. We have the uh, partition of self-righteousness that is installed in every event. I'll share with you a very uh, funny but truly ironic story about partition. One of the masajid, they invited me to a picnic. They have a partition in the masjid and they have a partition everywhere they go as well, right? See, so they go to a public park, they have a partition in the park. And then the brothers on one side, the sisters on the other side, the rest of the park is open. It's open space. On the brothers' side, there is a little, uh, you know, the, the, the sand volleyball? A whole bunch of girls, very skimpy clothes, are playing volleyball on the brothers' side. <laughs> but on the sisters' side, oh, there's a partition. We don't know what's going on back there. Right? <laughs> this is how ironic it has become in the Muslim community. Now, compare this with the Prophet ﷺ. He comes to Mecca the very first day, right? And two of the, of the ten men on the list of most wanted, you know, only ten men were supposed to be executed because they have committed so many crimes. And he tells the Muslims, those are the only ten men you're supposed to go after, right? Two of them hide at the house of Umm Muhanit bint Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, Prophet's cousin. Out of all houses in Mecca, he goes there to rest and take a shower and just relax a little bit. Ali ibn Abi Talib, his cousin, comes running to the house and says, Ya Rasulullah, two of those men are actually hiding in that room in the back of the house. And Umm Hani comes to the Prophet ﷺ and she says, Ya Rasulullah, qad ajawtahu. I have given them safe passage. I've given, I've given them refuge. What does he say? Umm Hani, where is the partition? Um Muhani, cover your face, go in the other room and talk to me. Um Muhani, your voice is awa. He says, Qad ajarna man ajarti ya um Muhani. I give refuge to whomever you give refuge to, ya um Muhani. That's it. End of story. Criminals are saved because of, of the refuge, the decision, the honor of that woman, radiallahu anha wa ardaha. I tell you, the Prophet وسلم, is a man that you should feel honored to follow, alayhi salatu wasalam. On that very same day, when Muslims are destroying the idols and the hustle and bustle around Kaaba and the conquering army is coming in, 
And the Prophet leaves everyone. When he saw an old woman walking by, he goes up to her, he takes off his cloak, puts it on the ground, invites her to sit down, and he sits down with her, with her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They speak for an hour, and the Sahaba are standing afar watching them, right? Observing what they're doing. Sometimes they're laughing, sometimes they're smiling, sometimes they're crying. He comes back an hour later, Ya Rasulullah, what was that all about? Who was that woman that took you away from us? The Prophet ﷺ starts crying, and he says, that was Khadija's best friend. We were remembering the good days of Khadija, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember, it is the honor of following Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam. We associate manliness with seeking honor from false pretenses. Manliness with arrogance. I belong to this family, I belong to that tribe, I have this skill, I have that education, I have this job, I drive this car. We make it so difficult for each other to get married because, you know, he is not from my tribe and she is not from my country. Right? Compare that with Hakim ibn Hizam, radiallahu anhu. A man who has every reason to feel honorable and to feel manly and to feel strong about himself. A direct descendant of Ismail, alayhi salam. He was from the descendants of Qusay ibn Kilab, the founder of Quraysh. He is from the Khwailid family, the family of Khadija. He was the closest friend of the Prophet ﷺ in the days of Jahili. And he used to own Dar al Nadwa. Did you hear of Dar al Nadwa? The town hall, the honor of Quraysh that is, was established by Qusay ibn Kilab. It was the most important piece of property, piece of real estate in Mecca. He owned it. But he only accepted Islam after the conquest of Mecca. Later, at the time of Muawiyah, uh, Hakim ibn Hizam sold uh, Dar al Nadwa, the town hall of Mecca. And Muawiyah was very upset, he was furious. He invited him to reprimand him. He said, Ya Hakim, how could you sell the honor of Quraysh, the honor of the Arabs, to a Persian man? He said, Well, he was Muslim. He said, How could you do that? And then he told him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Those definitions of honor, that was the old days. Today, honor is defined by taqwa. Honor is defined by Islam. Who cares about these considerations? And you know what? Be my witness. I will donate the 100,000 dirhams. I will donate them. Because I'm not, I don't feel manly and honored by my tribe anymore, by my possessions anymore. I feel manly and honored because of my deen. See the definitions? We have completely twisted them. We associate manliness with toughness. You've got to be harsh. You've got to be tough. You've got to be masculine, right? We associate manliness with the testosterone, as I said. We associate manliness with the lack of empathy, lack of compassion. You can't cry. It's the culture of boys don't cry, right? But believers do. True men weep. You know why? Because they have hearts that are alive. And it is not just the Prophet ﷺ. You know, we know that he used to cry a lot, alayhi salatu wasalam. Bilal comes to him right after Fajr to say Adhan, and he finds the Prophet crying and weeping, and, and I mean not just a little tear that you can just wipe, right? I mean weeping. And he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, he starts crying himself, you know, Bilal, out of, out of empathy with the Prophet ﷺ. Ya Rasulullah, you, you weep a lot, you cry a lot, you worship a lot, and Allah has forgiven all of your sins. You don't have to do this anymore, right? And the Prophet cries more and he says, Ya Bilal, afala akuna abdan shakur? Should I not be a grateful servant for all the blessings that Allah has given me? Umar ibn Khattab used to have the two lines, the two, two dark lines out of constant crying on his cheeks. Abu Bakr as siddiq they used to, used to call him, Kana rajulan asifa. He used to be a weeping person, just cries all the time. He was hardly able to lead Salah when the Prophet was sick, remember? But it wasn't just those noble men, it was every other Sahabi. Brothers and sisters, the whole issue of only girls cry, men don't cry, this is a modern fabrication. Men and women used to cry and express their emotion in a sincere way. Right after Hunayn, remember when the Prophet distributed all the booties of war to, to the new Muslims and he wouldn't give the, the Ansar anything. And some of them felt a little bit weird about this and they came to him, Ya Rasulullah, I mean you gave your countrymen, your cousins, all the booties and, and we didn't get anything. And he says to them, would you be satisfied that people go home with wealth and money and you go to your dwellings with Muhammad? Would you be satisfied? 
Everyone goes with wealth, and you go home with Rasulullah, and they said, Ya Rasulullah, Radina Billahi wa Rasulihi Habban wa Nasiba. We accept Allah and His Messenger as our share in this world. And they all started crying. The story says, Fabakaw hatta akhdalu lihahum. They cried until they wet their beards in a public meeting. They didn't say, Let's hide and cry because men don't cry. Right? In front of each other, in the presence of each other, in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they all cry. We associate manliness with vengeance, with retaliation. Show them what you're made of. Show them your strength. Show them that you're a man. Forgiveness is for girls. Compare that with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi entering Mecca. And one of the Sahaba who was hurt so much, who lost many family members, they confiscated his property, his, his land, and his livestock. And he's filled with anger. And he's on his horse entering Mecca saying, Today is the day of bloodshed. And today, nothing sanctified will be saved. Nothing sacred will be saved. What does the Prophet say when he says this? When he sees this? He looks at him and he says, No. Today is the day of mercy, is the day of forgiveness. Today is the day on which everything that is sacred will be saved. He can't save us. And he enters the city of Mecca and he addresses them. Hey guys, why are you so worried? What do you think I'll do to you? He says, Ya Muhammad, we've always known that you're a good man. We're expecting you to do nothing but good. You are free to go. There will be no retaliation today. You have absolutely nothing to worry about. Was that considered weak? That was a true manliness of Muhammad We associate manliness with the issue of flirtation, right? You gotta flirt with the opposite gender. You have to show that you're a man. And if you're not acting like this, people think there's something wrong with you. You're weird. If you're not flirting with, if you're not trying to be a clown in front of the girls, if you're not trying to win them over and make them laugh, then there's something wrong with you. If you're being respectful and you're lowering your gaze and, and you're still interacting with them with the utmost respect. But, you know, society has taught us that if we act in this humble, respectful way, there's something wrong with us. Compare it with Musa alayhi salam. When he arrives at the spring in Median and he sees the two girls are trying to push their flocks away so they don't get mixed up with the livestock of the other men that are that are surrounding the well. He found two women are trying to push their livestock away so they don't, don't get mixed up with the other livestock and people will claim them. What does he do? He immediately penetrates through the lines. He helps the two women and then he retires back to the shade of the tree. And what does he say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer. Ya Allah, for all the blessings that you have given me, I am so undeserving. I am a sinner. I have done terrible things, but you give me safety. And you help me come here. And you give me an opportunity to help those two ladies. Right? And then I don't find it in my heart to take advantage of them or to flirt with them. And I just retire to the shade away from everyone. Ya Allah, I am so undeserving of your blessings. And then one of the girls, so impressed, with Musa alayhi salam, she comes to him and she says, uh, my father is asking you to come with us, he would like to compensate you for what you have done. And actually the Prophet tells us the story that Musa was walking in the front, the girl was in the back, and, and she would uh, throw a pebble in order to show him uh, direction. So throw the pebble you know, to the left, so he walks to the left. <laughs> pebble to the right, he walks to the right, because he doesn't want to be walking behind her, it's desert, you know, her, you know the wind is blowing her clothes, whatever, he would not want to put her in, in a position of, of, of shyness or embarrassment. So he's walking in front of her, uh, Musa alayhi salam, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his blessings upon him and our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We associate manliness with equivocation, with manipulation. You're a man if you're able to get things done, and using all kinds of different methods to get it done. Just, just do it, right? Say what you don't mean. You don't have to be honest. You don't have to be, uh, 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 you don't have to be sound in, in what you say. Veracity doesn't matter. Truthfulness doesn't matter. 
compare that with Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, radiallahu anhu, right before Badr, on his way to the city of Medina, he was uh, intercepted by some Meccan agents who arrested him. And they told him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Medina just to visit my cousins. He said, no, you're going there to fight with Muhammad. He said, no, I promise. I'm not going to fight with Muhammad. He says, you give us your word? He says, I give you my word. I will not fight with Muhammad. He arrives in Medina. He says, Ya Rasulullah, do you believe those guys? They arrested me and they made me promise that I'm not going to fight with you. Who cares? Promise given to the kuffar. Who cares about that? What does the Prophet say? The Prophet said, we will fulfill the promise and seek Allah's power against them. And he would not allow Hudayfa to fight with him in Badr because of a promise he made. Does that demonstrate weakness of the Prophet Absolutely not. Let me finish inshallah with one last comparison. We associate manliness with boldness. If you're shy, you're a girl. If you have hayat, you're not man enough, right? You gotta be bold. You have to be daunting, right? You cannot feel any sense of modesty or shyness, right? You don't have to have hayat because you're a man. They teach you that. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. They say that one of his greatest characteristics, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was that كان أشد حياء من العذراء في خدرها. He was. He had more حياء. He had more shyness in him than a virgin that never left her father's house. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Did that ever prevent him from dealing with people and carrying out the tasks that that he, that he was responsible for? Never. He told us once, الحياء شعبة من الإيمان. Having the, the shyness of modesty is one of the levels of Iman. If Iman is 70 some levels, one of them that completes and perfects your Iman is to have Haya man or woman. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring uh, the, uh, His blessings into our lives and I ask Him to accept our good deeds to forgive our sins. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us follow in the footsteps of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to make his sunnah alive uh, in our hearts and in our lives. I ask Allah as he gathered uh, these uh, good hearts in this place seeking the knowledge of the deen, I ask him inshallah to gather all of us in his jannah on the day of judgment. Allahumma ameen, zakum al khair for being such good listeners. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.